fall. So we started already on uh, last week in Aalto, and then next week we will continue in Aalto, and then again every other week here in Kumpula again. So I'm Lauro Ruotsalainen. I'm an associate professor of this department here, and I'm running the machine learning cafe together with Professor Sami Kaski from Aalto University. Sami is concentrating on work, but, but he is there, and so, so you can meet him at, at Aalto then. Okay. And then, then I, I get some help from, from Ehsan and Gahalea with the recording of, of these speeches. But so let's start today. I'm, I'm very pleased and honored to, to present your today's speaker, Harri Valpola, who is a CAO and co founder at Curios AI. And then he will be talking to us about FKI Next Generation Data Efficient Deep Learning. So please. Thank you. Uh, so yes, I'm Harri Valpola from the Curious AI company. Um, we founded the company four years ago to do artificial general intelligence in the real world. So I don't believe in, in AGI research which happens somewhere close from the real world. But I, I think that real intelligence is something which solves real problems in the real world. And today I'm going to talk about how this deep reinforcement learning, particularly model-based reinforcement learning, is, is applicable to real world. What kind of problems it has and how we've solved them and then what kind of applications we have managed to, to implement already. Um, so I'm not going to talk so much about the, the research program as such. Um, there is this uh, next generation data efficient deep learning program, which, which, in, which includes um, things like semi-supervised learning, which, which means that then, then you don't need so, many, so much labeled data. But this um, model-based reinforcement learning is definitely one of the things that, that means that we can be very data efficient. I'll try to explain you during this talk. So this is now more, a little bit more narrow than the, the general program. Um, so the contents is first, what is model-based reinforcement learning? Uh, I, I guess some of you at least know what it is, but just in case, um, I'll go, I'm going to go through, through that. Then I'm going to discuss a little bit about why it's so difficult. Everybody would love to do it, but most people who have tried it have failed. And particularly if you try to use very complex models like deep learning, deep neural networks, it, it tends to fail. Um, we've managed to overcome the problems and the uh, key to, to solving the issues is get deep learning or deep neural networks understand their uncertainty, understand their confidence. Uh, and I'm going to explain you how that works, particularly in, in connection with uh, model-based reinforcement learning. There are many other techniques than what I'm going to explain for, for coupling deep learning and uncertainty, or Bayesian inference, or how, however you want to call it. But actually, many of them fail when you try model-based reinforcement learning. So there are some very specific issues with with this model-based reinforcement learning that make it very hard to solve this. So let me start with model-based control and reinforcement learning. Um, I assume that um, many of you have heard about deep reinforcement learning and most techniques that have been studied so far are something called model-free reinforcement learning. It means that there is no explicit internal model about the world. And, or let's say some, some people don't understand what, what does it mean to model the world. I mean modeling the environment and self and all, all, the, all the dynamics that's, uh, that's necessary for planning. So in model-free model reinforcement learning, what you can do is you can learn some, some policy, but you cannot apply planning because planning would require you to understand the dynamics of the world. So we humans, obviously, we can plan, we can imagine 
when, when you dream, for instance, you are running your internal simulations of the world. This is something that you cannot do in model-free reinforcement learning because you do not have that model. Instead, you have policy network, which is basically a recipe for telling if you are in this situation, then you do that. Um, so, for instance, if, if my hand is burning, burning, I'll try to move my hand away. That's this kind of if-then uh, um, orders or recipe for, for what to do. It doesn't explain why. It only says what. And it doesn't also, also it doesn't explain what are the consequences. It just says what to do. And in um, model-free reinforcement learning, you try to typically uh, directly learn this policy gradient and many, many other techniques that, that exist are directly trying to learn this, this policy. Um, in model-based control and reinforcement learning, you do have an explicit model. Um, if somebody is familiar with control theory, uh, this is just optimal control. It's, it's something which uh, in, in control theory people take for granted. Okay, so this is, this is a normal way to do things. You model the world and then you figure out what happens if we do this or that. And then you, based on the goals that you have, then you, you try to figure out what to do. So planning is central to, to this optimal control. You do not have, typically, when, when you start, you do not have the policy at hand. You have to solve it. So it takes a little bit of computation, but it also gives you a lot of flexibility. Now, assuming that we did have a model, we could do amazing things. People have known for quite a while that if you have a perfect model of, let's say, robotics bodies, you know, the dynamics, you can, you can solve the control very efficiently and in simple, simple manner. Here's a video from, from many years back um, of multiple robots. This is a humanoid, and there's a perfect model of the humanoid. So the, uh, it's a simulator which is perfectly differentiable and, and stuff. So you can actually, so this, this is a like um, inverted uh, double ben, pendulum. Uh, the, the green, when, when you see green in, in this, it means that it's just demonstrating passive dynamics. Uh, but then when you turn the, the control on, it turns yellow, and then it's trying to optimize something. And the optimization algorithm is very simple, just gradient-based uh, optimization of the plan. And it's something called uh, model predictive control. This is a technique known in control theory. Uh, it just means that you have a finite horizon, and then you, you try to find a plan which optimizes the, the behavior to the end, and then you implement the first control action, and then you shift time, you, you take new observations, and then you replan. Maybe you start from the, the initial plan. So here is, for instance, demonstration of what, what happens if you, if you take a humanoid robot and then you perturb, you, you, so you're kicking it sometimes with that joystick thing that was shown on the video, or sometimes you turn it off. And there is no um, predefined actions here. All the actions are calculated on the fly. No learning involved, none whatsoever. It's just solving the dynamics. So let's say that you, you find a humanoid robot out there, and then you say, okay, how does it work? And then you try to throw it off, and it's always balancing, like, oh, ninja robot like that. You would think that, oh, wow, this is cool. This is, this is future. So obviously, since we don't have those humanoids running out there, there's something, something wrong here, like, okay, Cool, works in, in this simulation, but why not in the real world? And the reason is that th this is great if you have a perfect model of the dynamics, 
But if you don't, unfortunately, it sort of fails miserably, in fact. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But still, uh, before that, I'll show you one real-world case where model-based reinforcement learning actually does cool stuff. And in Zen Robotics, that was my previous company, um, Zen Robotics is nowadays doing robotic waste sorting, so recycling with, with industrial robots. Um, so there is a conveyor belt with waste, and then there are all kinds of sensors, and then there are robots that, that man manipulate the waste objects and sort them in correct uh, bins. And these robots, they've learned using model-based reinforcement learning. Um, we, we tried first, when, when making demos, we, we made stuff by hand, like the control algorithms were manually crafted. And it worked very nice in demonstrations. Maybe even in this, like the, this is a demo video, so this is pretty nice waste. Um, but when, when it was taken to a real waste sourcing facility, real waste, real, real stuff going on the conveyor belt, fails miserably. Um, luckily, we were already, back, back in 2012, we were already working on model-based uh, control and reinforcement learning solution for this thing. And it took like two weeks of real-world waste sorting to, to get it working really well. And it's been working ever since. So once, once it learned, then don't touch it anymore. It works. Cool. Um, had we tried applying model-free reinforcement learning, I think we'd still be collecting data. Uh, Model-based reinforcement learning can be tremendously efficient and practical. Something which I mean, you can really implement. It works for real. And the most important feature that distinguishes it from model-free reinforcement learning is that whereas model-free techniques, which you've maybe seen in Atari games or some, some other places where in, in games you can collect millions of uh, actions, thousands of years of gameplay, and then you learn eventually. But when you go to a real-world situation, we don't want to spend a uh, thousand years waiting for that robot to start to learn picking some waste. Model free, uh, mod sorry, model based reinforcement learning is much more efficient. And um, the efficiency comes from the fact that it's typically much easier to learn how the world works, what, what is the dynamics, what, what is the physics of the world. Or if you think of gameplay, what are the rules of the game? What happens if I make this move? Which are the legal moves? What are the next game states if I make these moves? That's a typically much more compact, compact set of, of information than if you think of what is the optimal way to behave in that world. What are the actions in different situations that you should take? So if you think of the game of chess, for instance, the rules of the game are pretty simple. Uh, I claim that I can pretty much in any game state tell which are the legal moves and what are the next game state if you make these moves. I have no idea whatsoever what is the optimal move in different game states. It's something which is very hard to, to figure out and it's a complex thing. So when you are trying to do model-free reinforcement learning, you are effectively telling the system that try to learn this optimal policy, uh, try to figure out what to do in different situations. But now we only need to know how the stuff works and then we apply planning. Another cool thing is transparency. When you have a policy network, it just does, does stuff. In this state, do that. It can tell what to do, but it cannot tell why. Model-based reinforcement learning in, in contrast, can tell you what it thinks will happen if we do this. And it can tell you that I think we should do this because then I predict this is what's going to happen. And then you, you can ask, okay, but why not do that? 
And then the system can say that, well, in that case, using its predictions, I predict this is what's going to happen. And we both agree that's not as good, right? And then that gives you some kind of way to understand why it's making decisions. You can communicate with this system to some extent, and you can, you can figure out uh, whether you actually want to follow the advice or whether you want to do something else. It's exactly the same thing as if you apply route planning. It also has an underlying model. It runs a simulation. Okay, what if the guy drives his bike this route or that route or whatever? And it makes predictions of what is the time. And then it can tell this prediction. It can visualize it for me and say, okay, I think maybe you should pick this blue route. On the other hand, if you want, you can also pick these other routes and it can tell me what, what is the um, trade-off that I'm making. Maybe I'll pick a more scenic route. I'll, I'll spend one minute more, but that, that's fine. So data efficiency and transparency alone are things which mean that we definitely would like to apply that. Uh, but not, not that many people are doing it. It's, well, we are not seeing those humanoids out there uh, balancing themselves uh, in an agile way. And in, in the Zen Robotics case, for instance, yeah, we did apply uh, um, model-based reinforcement learning, but the model was pretty simple. So not, not the kind of deep learning model that nowadays people are using in model-free deep reinforcement learning. There are actually many problems to overcome if you want to do properly model-based reinforcement learning. Uh, some of them are not unique to model-based. Uh, many, many of these problems also occur in model-free, but here are a few. This computation, that's unique for model-based reinforcement learning. So computation during runtime. Uh, model-free reinforcement learning spends a lot of compute during learning. But then during runtime, it just does stuff. It's blazingly fast. Model-based, almost by definition, needs to do this planning runtime. So you have to solve that somehow. And uh, the standard solution, which, which works and which we've also applied, is combine that with policy networks. Um, policy networks mean that you, you during runtime you, you, you get a, some kind of result immediately or maybe a selection of results. That's, that's for instance how Alpha Zero worked. It used uh, planning and very standard um, handcrafted rules of the game and, and so on. Um, it, it has a Monte Carlo free search algorithm which doesn't require any, any learning. It, it works from scratch. But it's very inefficient. In order to get a uh, world-class player, you would have to spend an eternity simulating that, that uh, planning operation. But then when you combine it with policy network, the policy network can make the planning much faster. It can suggest a few uh, solutions that the planning can concentrate on. Uh, novice chess players spend much more computational cycles, their, their brain is more active than an experienced chess player. The experienced chess player has learned using model-free techniques or this, I mean, it has learned a policy network to give these suggestions so that the, the expert doesn't need to think so much. And yet we know how, how the game goes. The expert obviously beats the, the novice who is still thinking about the first few moves and the the expert player quickly sees, okay, this is how it's going to end, so I win. Horizon problem um, is something which we, we encounter in more complex real world situations. Um, if you take a game of Go, for instance, you might be able to simulate all the way to the end. But if you, if you think of more, more complex um, situations that you, let's say just cooking a dinner planning the dinner one muscle movement at a time and planning it all the way to completion is just way too complicated. Uh, there, are, there are too many steps uh, in, in between starting and 
having a full, full belly. Um, too many steps involved at the lowest level. Uh, there are um, ways to overcome this, and this is not, this is not unique to model-based reinforcement learning. Model-free uh, techniques will suffer from exactly the same problem. It's very hard to get a robot to learn to cook in model-free model reinforcement learning. So value functions, for instance, which means that you can have a finite planning horizon and then you evaluate your situation after that without thinking all the way to the end, or using hierarchical planning where you might think about um, like, how, how do I make this muscle movement so that I can cut the cucumber? But then you don't think about the muscle movements anymore when you, when you think about um, later stages. You, you just think in more abstract terms. And this is actually a nice thing. It's very nicely compatible with model-based reinforcement learning. It's much easier to devise hierarchical models of the world than, than to have complex hierarchical policy networks. Um, local minima of policy is, is an issue to overcome. And this is, again, not unique to model-based reinforcement learning. But uh, when, when you don't know um, how the world works when you start, and you don't, know, um, you don't know what to do, you don't have any data, you need to do something to get data. But then um, you might, if, if, you, if you are greedy, if you try to do the best thing all the time, you, you may quickly end up in a local minimum of the policy. And now I'm not talking about the local minimum of the world model or the dynamics model, but I'm talking about the local minimum of what you will end up doing. So when you, when you close the loop and you, you, you make this uh, learning system, you not only plan, but then you also act and then you gather more data, and then you, re you update your model. If you don't try new things, so if you don't um, on purpose try something which you are not sure whether this will work or not, uh, so, so you, you need to be willing to spend some money or like you, you, you have some kind of cost for this exploration. But then you benefit later. You need to invest in in doing stupid things now so that you learn better, so that you can do better things later. And exploration is, is something that you always need to figure out how to do properly if you, if you want to really apply uh, reinforcement learning, model-free or model-based. Um, the last point is the, is the point where mostly model-free reinforcement learning then fails. Everything else is pretty much solvable, but then the last step is something which fails. And that's um, the fact that when you start applying planning, you actually expose all the weaknesses of the model very quickly. Um, so planning plus complex internal models just don't mix well. I'm going to show you an example. Um, a few years ago, we were trying out, OK, Let's try with this humanoid, same, similar humanoid as you saw in the, in the previous movie. But in that movie, the humanoid dynamics model was assumed to be completely known. And then the gradient-based optimization of the, of the plan or the actions was using this perfect model. Here, however, we, we learn the model from data. So we do something, um, some actions, and then we learn how the, how the world works, what happens if we lift, move this muscle, and what happens if we move that muscle, and, and so on. Then um, the, the graph on the, on the left shows what happens during planning. We start from, from a pretty good plan. We initialize it with um, some, we, we actually learn, learn with model-free reinforcement learning to have a decent initial uh, policy. So we can start with a decent plan, and then we see how, how well does this model-based planning perform. Uh, initially, the plan is OK ish, um, and then um, on the x axis, you have planning iterations. So we compute the forward predictions, then we go backward, 
do some gradient, gradient step um, and um, then see what's, what's happening next. The red curve is what the, what the system thinks is happening. So it thinks that, okay, I, I did this, this plan, now I take a gradient step and situation gets better. My, I'm going to get faster to the red ball or something. Um, and then it, it does it again. And again, it find, seems to figure, hey, now I found even better thing. I'm doing better. And then oh, as planning iterations proceed, it, it's getting more and more excited. Oh my God, I'm doing so well. Okay, it does have feelings like that, but <laughs> like, figuratively speaking, it's, it thinks that it's going to end up so well. And when we try it, we see that every planning step actually is making the situation worse and worse and worse. So not even a single step of planning was useful in this case. It only made the situation worse. And this is something that everybody who has tried this has uh, noticed they have hit their head in the brick wall. It's very hard to get uh, through that wall. Uh, this is a similar graph from a paper that was just accepted for NeurIPS conference. So we are going to present it in, in December. Um, so this graph was from two years ago, and now we are publishing it. So nowadays we have this policy that we first file a patent, and then when the patent is public, then we, when we submit papers to the conference. We've, uh, when we started the company, we needed publicity, and we were just submitting papers to conferences right away, but now we are sitting on, on some things for a while. Um, so this is half cheetah. Uh, simpler environment, but same problem. So black line here is what actually happens, whereas red line is what the system thinks it's doing. And the problem that we are seeing is basically the same as this famous pandas, uh, panda, panda picture. So adversarial uh, examples. If you take a pretty well uh, learned deep neural network that's able to recognize real world images and then you ask it what happens if um, how should we change the image how should we change the input image so that it becomes a gibbon for instance some some years ago uh, people were publishing this and everybody was like whoa, whoa whoa what's going on deep learning is so much so broken it's not broken if you give it normal normal inputs. So it's performing perfectly well in ImageNet test set, for instance. Not the samples that it's learned, but like normal test set images. But then when you try to ask it, okay, so tell me how, how to change these input pixels so that it becomes a gibbon, it, it gives complete gibberish. That's not a gibbon. It's still the same panda. I don't see any difference. What's going on? The symptom here is that Every time you try to do neural uh, inversion with neural networks, or complex enough uh, parametric models, you, you, take, you, you get nonsensical results. So it just doesn't, even if it works in one direction perfectly fine, it doesn't work in the other direction. And for control, this means that when, since we are trying to optimize the inputs, we are trying to optimize the, the action plan, which is input to the dynamics model. It fails. It gives this kind of adversarial plan. And the root cause here is that these neural networks, although they work perfectly fine for natural images, which were, they were trained with, if you move outside the manifold of natural images, these neural networks can give nonsen completely nonsensical results. And they don't notice it. There is nothing in the ne neural network output that tells you that, okay, now it's maybe not so certain anymore. It's just guessing. No, it's, it's confidently saying that, okay, this is, this is a gibbon. It's not. It's something which is outside the 
manifold of natural images. So in order to fix this problem, we really have to make these deep neural networks able to understand their own confidence or uncertainty. And there have been multiple different um, ways to try to solve this uh, adversarial planning attack. So optimal control people have been able to solve these problems, like control theory, people have been working with this. And nowadays there are thousands of factories that are running model-based um, control, model predictive control it's called in, in those circles. And the, the, re the way they have been able to do this is that they keep the model so simple that there is no room for adversarial attack. Linear models don't suffer from these adversarial attacks. And linear models is what, what this uh, model predictive control is using. It's all nice and fine if linear models are good. Then all, by all means use linear models and uh, be happy. Uh, Obviously, there are many, many real-world problems which are non-linear. That linear models are not, not going to be enough. Another solution which also works is to use proper Bayesian models. Bayes nets, Gaussian processes, uh, even deep Gaussian processes. And this is, this is something that is perfectly fine solution. It, it works. However, the, if, you, if you go to complex enough problems, uh, Bayes nets are not as good, or Gaussian processes are not as good at, at learning very complex dynamical systems as deep neural networks. Deep learning is still the most efficient, most versatile, most flexible or expressive uh, learning technique that we have. It's just that it's, it's not really very good at this Bayesian stuff. Um, another um, approach which has been in use in optimal control um, is we can regularize the planning so that we, we, we tell the system that, okay, this plan is good as long as you stay within the training manifold. So if X is the input to this, these models, and then we somehow measure what is the uh, likelihood or the probability of your input in light of your training data. So you assume that you're comparing your, your input sample or plan with the, the kinds of plans that you had in your training. And then if you, if you start going outside of your familiar training manifold, maybe you are, make, you are possibly making a mistake. So th this kind of regularization is actually what we are doing. We are going to apply this technique, but there are also many pitfalls. If you try, try this, this thing, and people have certainly thought about it, it fails too. Because, um, well, the problem is basically that we, we have a very complex deep learning model to model the dynamics, presumably because we have a complex situation at hand and we need, we need an expressive model. And then um, we are trying, in, in a sense, we, are, we have a leak in this deep learning model and then we are trying to patch it with something else, but that will also leak. And the reason is if you, if you use very simple model of your input data, you are restricting your your, your planning process and your, your deep learning network too much. It's a little bit like, okay, I want to go driving like crazy and I, I buy a Lamborghini. And then in order not to hurt myself, I set myself a five kilometers per hour speed limit. Okay, I'm driving a Lamborghini here. It, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so this is something that you can do if you have a simple, simple dynamics model then you, it's, it's okay to have a simple, simple model of the input probability. But if we, if we want really to take advantage of, of the expressivity of deep neural networks, we want to have a complex 
model of the, of the input. And then the problem is that the planning will then exploit the weaknesses of that model. So we could have a deep neural network modeling the input distribution and, and the dynamics, but then when we apply planning, planning will find place where both the forward model will, will give nonsensical results and the probability model will, will tell you that, hey, this is really, really looks like, like your training data, even if it doesn't. What we are going to do is we are going to uh, apply a neural network technique, deep neural network, which doesn't model probability of input directly, but models the gradient of log probability. And this turns out is the solution because then we can take this gradient outputs from the network and just believe, okay, this is the gradient, and then we don't need to backprop anymore through this network. And if you think of, I mean, one, one of, way of thinking about this is that when you backprop through the network, it, it exposes all the possible weaknesses of the, of the network so that the planning process can um, take advantage. But when we model the gradient, we don't need to expose the internals of the model if the gradient is the output of the model already. And these denoising autoencoders that we've been using turn out to do exactly that. So denoising autoencoders work in such a way that you take an input data set and then you corrupt those input samples and you, then you are training an autoencoder to denoise it. And you need to do it man, many, many times so that, but eventually, um, like when you're training, you, you can basically generate infinite amount of training data because you have, even if you have a finite set of inputs, you can corrupt them in infinite many ways and you, you can train this network to denoise it. And turns out that this uh, um, corruption process, although it's random, if you look, uh, look at the process locally, uh, like here, so we, we had random Gaussian uh, noise samples. If you look at the whole data set, the data cloud, it's a diffusion process. So if you take the average flow of where your data is going when you, when you add corruption noise, you see that it's going downward, the gradient of probability. If you have a perfectly flat distribution and then you randomly shuffle, uh, add noise, there is no net flow. But if you have uh, more samples in, in some direction, then they are just because of well, probabilities, uh, more samples are going from, from that higher, high, higher probability towards the lower probability. So when we train a denoising autoencoder, it actually learns the gradient field. So when we train the denoising autoencoders, we can, we can just read as the output of the network uh, so actually, it's the difference between input and output, if, to be very exact. But that's that's uh, log, a gradient of log probability. And now we have this paper in archive, which shows uh, how how this works and is great and the best thing ever. Uh, so in this case, for instance, that I showed, this is from the from the paper, um, without any uh, regularization you have this delusional planning. But when we add this denoising autoencoder regularizer, uh, it mean it's, uh, it's able to keep the plan um, familiar enough so that the network manages to make correct predictions about it. So it no longer thinks that, yeah, I'm doing exceedingly great. Uh, it's just, okay, this is a little bit better, but it's better nevertheless. So it's not possible in this case with the model to do, do any better. So it's important that it's, it's, it understands its own limitations. So works like charm. Uh, here is uh, episode one, pretty much random uh, movement. It's supposed to, so it hasn't learned pretty much anything yet. Uh, but with that training data, so now that was the training data, you, you learn the model and then you can do it. So with almost no training data at all. You can learn dynamics. So this is now 
the half cheetah, uh, and episode one, so hasn't learned anything, doing just more or less random, random stuff. Um, but then second episode is already running. How cool is that? So this is something that really, really can make a big difference in the real world, this kind of sample efficiency. We've been applying it to oil refining. Neste Oil has um, this oil refinery uh, some 50 kilometers from Helsinki. It's the world's world leader in aviation biofuels, this company. And we are helping them to build this digital co-worker. So if you think of normal... Um, how you would uh, apply uh, typically uh, model free techniques here you might try to learn to imitate what the what the operator is doing but then you would be limited to only those cases that you've seen so far but now when we learn to predict the model uh, to predict the process uh, it means that then the operator can tell um, okay this is where i want to go and then you can apply planning to give the to give the results and very little training data is enough to already give superhuman performance so if you do imitation learning you would be able to maybe copy the human behavior the average human behavior but in this case we can exceed human behavior with very little training like a uh, few days of <coughs> Training is <coughs> a few days of data collection is enough to, in some cases, beat humans. And this system is also able to tell when it doesn't know. So if, if you uh, try to ask it, what, what if we do this and that and that? Then the answer might be, sorry, I don't know. And that's, it's important that the system will tell. I think I'm almost in time uh, because this is the last slide. Summary. Model-based reinforcement learning is great for real world it's because it's sample efficient. That's, that's the main benefit. It's transparent and it hasn't been applicable in, in very complex problems because of these, these problems that I, I was talking about. But we have been able to overcome enough of them so that this is, this is something which I think uh, for, for FKI... Um, uh, program three, this next generation data efficient deep learning. I think this is this is definitely one key technology that we are using. In the Curious AI, we've been applying it for uh, industrial process control, like Neste, Neste oil refineries, uh, Sandvik's uh, autonomous mining machines, and then we are also applying discrete versions of these in logistics. Um, new new uh, Project that I can't talk talk yet about because we, we are still in the haven't haven't agreed about the publicity thingies, but yeah, more more to come. Thank you. <laughs>